I introduce Nana. Thank you. Can everyone hear okay? Is this loud enough back there? I'll try to project more. All right, so um, voting equipment has been discussed in the county clerk's office for quite some time because it has been 12 years since we've gotten new equipment. So it's been um, part of the budget discussions and part of the office staff expectation for at least five years. So it's not new, but it is new to kind of introduce to the public. And so this is our first opportunity to talk about it. We're in the middle of um, asking for bids from election equipment vendors. And so I can't really, because I don't know which, which vendors have submitted bids yet, but it's a very small pool. And so I wanted to at least start talking about what people wanted to see out of new equipment um, what people can expect when we do start getting the new equipment and uh, what that's going to look like because it'll be in effect for the 2020 election. So um, anybody that's gone to the polls knows that voting equipment is pretty much an integral part of election day and elections administration. It's a long-term investment. It's very expensive. It's something that we have to get right the first time. Um, and it's important to me that voters and poll workers, civic groups like the League of Women Voters and disabilities advocates are all part of the conversation because everybody needs to use voting equipment. Our staff needs to know how to program on it and poll workers need to know how to set it up so that we can have successful elections. The transition also from old equipment to new equipment also doesn't end just when we buy the new equipment. We also are going to have to revamp all of our training. Poll workers will have to go through all new training we're going to do public demonstrations so that people are not um, surprised when they go to the polls. They've seen this equipment before. It's not going to be terribly different, probably, than what we're already seeing. Um, but I want everyone to have the ability to um, play with the equipment, cast a, a you know, test ballot on it, and see how it operates so that they know what to expect when they go to their polling place. So our current equipment, like I said, it was purchased in 2006. It was pretty state-of-the-art at the time. Um, but if you think about how far even your cell phone has gone in the last 12 years, our memory capacity is very small. Security has gone a long way in the last 12 years. Um, it's pretty much time to, to revamp what we've got. So our current contract is with Election System and Software, ESNS. That's the kind of equipment that we use. Uh, that's who we use as our support when we have something that, that goes wrong and uh, that they come on site on election day to make sure that everything is working properly and they do all the maintenance on our current equipment. So we currently have 108 touchscreen machines with the ver voter verified paper trail. That's the iVotes. Those generally have only been used during the federal elections. So you'll see those at the polling place in August and in November. Uh, we do deploy them during the April elections, the local elections, in our central polling location. So they are still in use. And then we have 108 optical scan machines, those are the M100 machines. Those are the ones where when you get a paper ballot and you feed it into the machine for it to be counted, that's what's referred to as an optical scanner. We have not had to deploy all 108 at one time. I think maximum we've ever only had 80 to 82 polls during an election. So we have some in reserve. And over time, that's been incredibly important because we have machines that break down on election day and we've had to go into our reserve of 20 and make sure that uh, the machines at the polls have an operating optical scan machine. We also have a central, a central count scanner. And that is a huge piece of equipment that we have in the office that we use for our absentee voting. So central count scanners are what were used predominantly in smaller counties and uh, before we moved to the optical scan kind of model of voting, what happened was that everybody collected all the ballots at the polling places and used to bring them to the office and they would all get run through this one machine. We still keep it around because absentee voting is still done that way where we have ballots coming in by mail, ballots that are voted in the office. And so we have a large stack of ballots that at the end of the night we have to count. So that's what we use that for. And then we also do the programming of the election and ballots in-house. So we have someone on staff 
that uses the software that ESNS has so that it's compatible with our machines. And they physically um, put together the layout of the ballot. They do um, all of the prep work to make sure that we have the ballots. They're printed off-site and they're, they're sent to us so we don't have ESNS actually creating our election. We do that in-house. Does anyone have any questions about our current equipment? Yes. Uh, after the paper ballots have been sent through the machine, do you then uh, check the paper ballots against the count that the machine provides to verify that the machine is actually counting correctly? Yes. So we do have um, an audit requirement. So after election day, uh, election day, that's why all the results are termed unofficial. So we have until two weeks after the election to make them official, and that's done by having a board of verification uh, do an audit of the, it's a random audit of select precincts, and they check to make sure that they were accurately counted. So we do have an audit procedure, um, and that's statewide. Everybody has to do that. Yep. I, I understand this is current equipment, but there was a committee, I represented the league, Yes, we are starting over um, because at the point where we were at the RFP for that, it would have had to have been awarded and there wouldn't have been time for public comment. The only thing that could have been public if we had continued with that process was the machines would have been selected and then we could have done public demonstrations of the selected machines. And my preference was to have public input before we selected the machines. Um, so that's where we're at. Does that mean we lost that grant? We did not have a grant for that. We have money that was budgeted for the 2019 year, so we do have money in the budget for this year. But there was no grant money available. Do you have a <laughs> follow-up question about that? No. Okay. So this is what the equipment actually looks like. Um, everyone should be somewhat familiar with it. They've gone to a polling place to vote. Um, the bottom one is the optical scan machine, and the top one is the iVote machine. So the goals of this process, there's really a lot of goals uh, to making sure that we have good equipment and what it can do for the office and for the voters of Boone County. So, First and foremost, we're looking to replace our aging system, um, enhancing security features over existing system capabilities is something that's really important as well. Uh, upgrades to the ADA features and accessibility is a really critical component of it. The iVote machines have, have been kind of unwieldy for a lot of poll workers to use. They're very large. Um, they take a lot of time, especially if you're doing an audio ballot. It's a long process to go through the entire ballot. Uh, newer equipment tends to streamline that because that's been the feedback all of the vendors have gotten about these kinds of machines. And we also want to provide for future advancements in elections administration. So one of the other benefits, like I said, if you think about your cell phone and what it could do 12 years ago and what it could do now, you might have only had enough memory on your cell phone to hold a ringtone. You know, if you downloaded a song and you could put a ringtone on your phone as opposed to what you can do now. It's the same with elections equipment. So right now, on the equipment that we have, the polling place that that equipment goes to has the ballots for the people going to that polling place. With newer equipment, with the memory being larger, you can fit more styles of ballot on that machine, which means you can run an entire election off of one machine. Um, as long as you have the paper ballots that correspond to it. So what that means in a lot of the other jurisdictions that have been able to upgrade to newer equipment is that they can do things like central polling locations during an election or for absentee voting. So it offers voters more ability to get out and vote on days that are not necessarily the Tuesday of the election day. But it also allows anybody to come vote at them. So you don't have to be assigned to a central polling location. 
you can just go just like you could now if you came to the office on election day anybody could vote because we have every style of ballot um, but we have multiple machines in order to make that work this would only require one machine um, so we could have multiple machines to handle all of the voters that needed to come to the vote center is that because if you live in like Precinct 27A, you have certain choices, but if you live in Precinct 2, you have different choices of people? Correct. Okay, thank you. Yes. <clears throat> so would that mean there could be fewer, fewer voting stations, polling places? No, this, is, this would be like in advance of it. Um, so ones that are already pretty centrally located, for example, during a November election, um, there's always a, poll, a polling place on Mizzou's campus. If we made that a central polling location on election day, then anybody could come vote at it. It wouldn't just have to be the people that happen to be assigned to vote in the, um, at the university. So basically, every place could be central? Uh, we're limited by the law with how many central locations we can do. Oh, okay. um, but it is, it's at least an opportunity to have that's made much easier by having new equipment. Yes? I'm concerned that there'll be fewer places to go. Like, if I have to go wait in line at Mizzou, I'd be much, much less likely to vote. Well, you'd still have your polling place oh, okay. available okay. that would be tied to where you live. Okay. This would be an additional, you know, if you happen to be on campus at that time and you don't, you're worried about rushing back home to get to your home polling location, you could vote there instead. Okay, thank you. Yes? So are, you, are you going to um, retain paper ballots so if there's a physical record of every person that's the goal, yeah, that's the goal is to have, that's why I'm saying it's not terribly different equipment wise from what we're looking at, because um, optical scans are our standard. Yeah. Is what you're saying is that this central location can print the paper ballots for any precinct? Um, that will depend on the type of equipment, and that's one of the things that we need to take into consideration. It may be that we have multiple styles of the ballot that actually accompany the machine when we send it out. So um, I know that, I want to say in the 2008 election, it was tested out whether a central polling location would work, but because it required multiple machines and uh, it didn't work as well and the equipment should, should help with that so that we can offer that to people. Yes. Do the electronic machines then kick out a paper ballot too of responses? How, how do you have that backup then on the iVote? On the iVote that we have now, it records on the side. So there's a paper that records on the side. Okay, and the new machines would do it how? That's what we have to wait for the responses to see which ones that they're going to test to us. I know that there were ones that were presented to us earlier, and I don't know if any of the advancements have changed or if they have changed any of the the specs on any of them um, some of them print out a barcode some of them print out the um, the list of candidates that the voter has selected it's entirely dependent on the system for how they have chosen to do the paper okay yes I think maybe I misunderstood but I believe that our um requires a paper ballot. That is not to be, I mean, they're tight maybe, but a state right. requires it, right? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, we're all concerned about paper ballots, but I think right now we have to. <laughs> yes, so, and that's a good segue into what the basic voting requirements are that we already have, and this is instituted by federal and state law, so any kind of equipment that we ever use in this county will adhere to these anyway, because we can't purchase it legally if they don't. So first, all of the equipment has to be certified by the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. That's the federal elections agency that oversees elections. Um, then it has to be approved by the Missouri Secretary of State's office. And that's a vetting process that's part of the, the work that I did when I was in the Secretary of State's office. The vendors come and they do a demonstration. Um, there's an analysis of, uh, how it counts the ballots, you do a test deck, um, and they make sure that it's 
it's ready to go before it can even be purchased by the county. So it's got to be vetted at the federal level, then the state level. The law requires um, secret ballots, voting in absolute secrecy for everybody, and it requires a paper audit trail. So whether that is, like currently what we have is paper ballots that get fed into an optical scan machine. The iVotes, uh, like I said, as you're making your selection, it prints it on a little roll of paper that looks like a receipt and it rolls through the machine. And so the voter doesn't get anything out of that, but it's got all of the transactions that the voter makes logged. So even if you select somebody and then unselect them, it makes a record of that. So uh, that's, the, that's the audit trail we currently have on our electronic equipment. And then accessibility features are something that uh, is required by both federal and state law. So. I will say um, Missouri law is pretty far ahead of a lot of other states in requiring the paper requirement because that's something that uh, when HAVA was first passed and people started buying new equipment in 2005, 2006, everyone thought touchscreen was going to be the way to go. And there are still states that have 100% touchscreen, no paper trail at all. Um, and Missouri thought ahead and said, you know, we really don't want that to happen. And so they put in that a paper trail would be required. And that's what's come back around as in the elections administration world and security world, what's come around is people are saying, you know, we really do need that paper trail. Uh, there's a lot of new types of auditing uh, that are available that people are um, starting to institute in other states. Colorado is a big one that's, that's instituted it, and that kind of auditing requires the paper trail. You can't do auditing in any real sense that gives anybody any kind of security or, or confidence in the election if you don't have a paper trail. So we're definitely going to be doing that. So would it be faster to choose something that's already in use, um, that's already been vetted by the Missouri Secretary of State's office? Uh, yeah, it will be. I mean, most... In, in at least my experience in the Secretary of State's office and from talking to other county clerks, most vendors won't even bid on something unless they've gone through this process because they, they know that if it hasn't gone through the process and they pitch it to a clerk, a clerk says, have you been through this process? Because otherwise I'm not going to accept your, your bid. Okay. So when they, usually when they bid um, and from talking to other county clerks, they provide the certification that shows that it's gone through both the EAC and the Missouri Secretary of State's office. So right now, this is what our request for proposals has in it. Based on what we currently have as equipment, this is what we've asked for vendors to provide um, explanation specs and costs to us. So 100 paper-based paper precinct tabulators, those are the optical scan machines. It's just the fancy word for optical scan machines. Um, 100 ballot marking devices. So this is a new term that's come into use as uh, the vendors and election equipment suppliers have started to kind of move away from the iVotes. So iVotes are known as DREs, they're direct touch screens. Um, ballot marking devices look more like uh, iPads almost and what they do is you know you make your selections and it prints something out um, or it uh, in some cases there are other manufacturers that physically fill out a ballot so you insert the ballot and then you make your selections and it kind of just prints right on your ballot um, so at this point in time, I know the three, from going to the, the previous demonstrations, I know the three sort of what they look like, but you can maybe speak to whether you got to play with it or touch it or anything as a visual. Um, I'm not sure how how they were used. I, Sharon, I don't know if you had an opportunity to... Yeah, So um, 
We've also asked for a central count scanner so that uh, we can continue doing absentees um, and the requisite software so that we can continue doing our in-house programming. Yes? Um, are you asking for bids that either includes or excludes doing the ballot <coughs> formatting itself? Um, or are you still wanting to keep that in-house? We have requested to keep it in-house. So okay. in the bid it says that um, the vendor is going to have to be okay with us programming the election and our ballots. Okay. So the bids right now, um, this went out at the beginning of March, so the bids are due back by April 4th. Uh, and I did want to let people know, because everyone's used to using an iPad for checking in at the polling places, that is not part of the equipment. So that is not going to change. Um, so no one will have to get used to a new check-in process. We won't have to worry about doing different training for that. Um, it's not technically considered part of the voting equipment system. Yes. Yes. What percentage of voters actually use the iVote? It's very small. Um, and. Yes. In my limited experience, and so, and so I'm just kind of wondering. It's very there small. Are different ways to manage this. Yeah. Well, and and my hope is that with with newer equipment that's a little more streamlined or even just smaller. I mean, a lot of the ballot marking devices are just physically smaller. Um, it will help. You know, if a voter's not having a clunky experience going through it, they may be able to use it better, especially the audio function, because primarily the equipment is out there in order to assist voters that require um, audio or, you know, larger font or something like that. So um, I am hopeful, at least, or optimistic that in the bids that we get back and when we do these demonstrations and we have people um, casting ballots on them during these demonstrations that they will see a difference. That's, that's what my goal is. So in the request for proposals, what we have also asked of the vendors, in addition to making um, the bid, is to come on site and do a public demonstration of election day equipment. I anticipate that this will be something that is at a community center like the ARC um, or here um, sometime in April, but it will obviously will depend on who bids and when we, we do all that scheduling. But what it would be is the ability for anybody that wants to come see it to physically touch it, um, cast test ballots on it, see how they like to use it, see and, and have all of them next to each other so that you can do a fair comparison of them. Um, And then the goal is to make a final determination by the beginning of June. So if we make that determination in June, we have enough time to do all of the training uh, and all of the setting up of the equipment, because when it comes in, we have to test it all. So all of those machines will have to go through rigorous testing when they come on site. Um, and that will, yes? Um, so we've got an election coming up in April. Now, obviously, this is not going to be that election, so are we be using the old model? Yes, yeah. Um, and I would anticipate, um, I haven't heard if we're going to do an August election. I also haven't heard if we're going to have a November election. They would both be special elections called, uh, August would be around Memorial Day. If we have an August election, I will not feel comfortable because we won't have enough training to get new equipment up. We could do it in November, but most likely uh, the presidential preference primary will be when this rolls out. So how far in the future, and if it, and how, how many years do you expect to use the new equipment? Ten? I would expect ten um, as, a, as a ballpark figure. Um, ten seems to be how the vendors have been working out their maintenance schedules and warranties. Yes? Uh, there's a great deal of talk around about doing instant uh, voter 
run off the land. So we, we pick the choices one, two, three, four for each candidate. So are these machines going to be able to handle that also? It, it's definitely something to consider. So making sure that we have the flexibility to take into account um, changes to election law is really important. So um, one, of the, one of the nice things, I guess, about the election equipment vendor community is that most of these places are serving states that run all different kinds of elections, so they have the capability of doing that. Um, and that's the same with our poll pads. There are different requirements in every jurisdiction, and so they've they've become very flexible with that. So, those are definitely questions uh, that we that we're going to ask of the vendors as well: is um, what their systems can handle and what would require large modifications. Yes. Will there just be one date for this um, public demonstration? Um, for there? For this, um, yes, there will be one for before the RFP is um, uh, awarded, and that'll be it'll be a long day worth of thing. It won't just be like one hour. It'll be a, a long span of time so people can come in and come out. Uh, then there will also be once we select it and we start the training process and everything. There's going to be lots of public demonstrations. So that people can get acquainted with the equipment. All right. So this is um, something that came up earlier. The 2019 budget does have 1.2 million dollars allocated in it for election equipment. That is the um, close to the anticipated cost of what it will likely be to um, pay for all of that election equipment. And we'll see when the bids come in how closely aligned they are with it, but this is what the current budget is. And uh, kind of as I, as I talked about it beforehand, this has been something that's been on the horizon for at least five years, that the 2020 election cycle with it having a presidential preference primary, an April election, an August primary, and a November general will require new equipment. So we'll, we have to be ready to go by then. Does anyone have additional questions? I know there isn't too much information on specifics that I can offer at this time, but I'm more than happy to talk about our current equipment, um, what everyone wants to see out of new equipment, and uh, how this process is going to work. Yeah. Yes, she she said that she would prefer, um, and she thought it would be a good idea to make sure that uh, I'm assuming you're talking about for ballot marking devices, that it would show what selections the voter made before they are cast, before they cast their ballot. So if they show, if they uh, you just use the machine. Yeah, if you just use the ballot marking touchscreen. Yes. I, I um, am very appreciative of what happened. Well, it needs to, so the RFP is available on the website. I mean, it's publicly available. Uh, if you go to the purchasing page of the county commission website, that's where all of the bids are. So you will can see that in addition to the public demonstration, there's also a requirement that they come on site for the staff of the office. So like how we do the programming right now, we need to make sure that what we program works on other machines. 
and that they can prove to us that we're compatible with what they're doing. So there is a, a requirement that they basically set up an entire election using the software, using the data that we give them. And we say, you know, here's the data that we use when we program our election equipment. Use it and put it on yours and prove it, that it will happen. So I wanted to make sure that, that staff felt comfortable and that they have the opportunity to ask whatever questions that they need to make sure that the equipment is going to um, continue working. Because if we have software issues and we have ballot programming issues, then even if everybody loves actually voting on the equipment, we have no ballots to put into the machines, it's really not going to help. Is the equipment totally standalone, or is it an internet connected it, in any way? It is not internet connected in any way, and that's uh, that's one of the requirements we have now that will continue on. Um, the the software that creates the ballots is not connected to the machines at all. The uh, computer that actually counts the ballots that has the software where we insert the memory cards and it counts the ballots is not connected to the internet or the rest of the machines at all. Everything is very siloed. Yes? The, I, I've always been impressed with the willingness of our county to spend money for elections and I, I think that that's part of the reason that we have such a good election running here. Could you comment on the question of the county and, and how, how, how come we have such a good budget for we, yes. election equipment? We are incredibly fortunate for two reasons. One is that the county has always been very responsive um, to Wendy and her request for uh, getting the equipment that she needed to keep the election going and that is an an ongoing legacy I think that she has left is that the commission recognizes the need to support elections in this county. And the second thing um, is that we have uh, a separate fund that has been slowly growing. It hasn't gotten to the point of, of $1.2 million, um, but there is a separate fund for equipment that's in the county that we've been able to tap into um, so that we can we can afford that. So uh, it is rare from talking to other county clerks, it's very rare yeah. that we have this kind of um, ability to pay for equipment as we need it. Um, so I want to make sure that we're good stewards of that money and, and getting the most of the equipment that we can and uh, getting something that's gonna last us a long time so it's a good investment. I know public turnout for things like demonstrations is not that great. Um, one idea might be to have, um, while the long lines are, are, while people are waiting in their long lines for the poll, maybe the demonstration of how to use the equipment then would be good before they hit the polls. During the March election? Yeah, during I, the election. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. We can include that in our training. Yes. Um, speaking of lines, how many machines do you anticipate being at each polling place? Um, so right now, we have one optical scan at each polling location, and but, but these may be ballot printing machines. Well, there will be. That's the the equivalent of the ballot printing machine is the iVote. So we'll still have an optical scan. Oh paper ballots. I'm still looking. We'll still have an optical scan machine with paper ballots at each of the polling locations. No, I, I mean, <clears throat> if I come up net right now, um, if I want a paper ballot, I go and I do the normal stuff and I'm handed a piece of paper. And I know some of these from visiting when the previous vendors were here. Some of them, you went up and you, um, like the the ballot marking device. Yes. <clears throat> so there you aren't given a paper ballot, right? But it's an option. None of, I don't anticipate from this RFP and the direction that we are going, um, 
it will not be something where the only option that you have when you go to the polling place is a ballot marking device. You'll have paper ballots available. That'll still be the same situation that we have now. Yeah. Because yeah. there are some, I mean, that is one of the things that, like you said, nationally, um, you hear about these places. I think actually St. Louis County is fanning out for their machines right now, and they're trying to do the majority ballot marking devices because they want to have basically kiosks and just have ballot marking devices and then the paper ballot be kind of a, you know, if you need a paper ballot, do that. But that's also a continuation of how St. Louis County has done. They use iVote machines too and they use primarily iVote machines. Mm -hmm. So if you are a St. Louis County voter, you are used to voting on a touch screen because that's what they've always done. So their new ballot marking devices are going to mimic what they've been doing. Um, I would prefer to stay with a very paper-based system and have the ballot marking available, just like we have for the iVotes. Um, and my goal is also to have the ballot marking device available at every election, um, as opposed to the iVotes, which are only available at the August and November, so that we have a, a more consistent equipment schedule. So it might be interesting for you to ask how many people like the paper ballot. Oh yeah, preference. how many people prefer paper ballots? <laughs> Good. Um, have people had experience with the iVote machines, either voting on them or what has what has your response been to the iVote machines? Because I know what mine is. But. They're slower. They're broken. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and wasn't replaced. Yeah, yeah the paper gets caught a lot. No, <laughs> well, one of them has the paper that gets on the trail. Would you repeat what was said? Um, what, somebody said that it was a slower system. Um, someone that served as a uh, poll worker said that it had it, the machine itself broke and and wasn't replaced. Um, I couldn't fix it. Yes. Um, yes. I was a poll worker when the first introduced the I votes. I remember that very first election. We had almost in our precinct almost a 50-50 split mm -hmm. because we were pushing it and people were doing. But the only time I was in charge of the I vote, and I was like, I was real proud trying to keep people doing that. Right. It was it line up because of the slowness, and then people would say, "Now nah, I want a paper ballot." And I think since then it hasn't been pushed as much. It's more <coughs> for visibility only. If you need it, it's available. So it hasn't been pushed as much as it was that first time. And I think that to me, it's slowed, it's slower, so that has, it's tapered off. And that's been my experience too. I was a election judge in St. Louis County the year that they launched their I votes as well. And it was kind of the same thing where people were not thrilled that they were doing it. They were really interested because it was new and they wanted <laughs> to see what it was like. But by the end of using it, they were like, this was not that great. We really don't want to do this again. Um, Mari has a quick question. Just a comment that with the paper ballots, there are numerous slots where you can go sit down, do your business, and get out. And I think that's one of the key differences. That with there, are, unless you were able to have 25 machines per precinct, especially during peak times, it's just much quicker to get in and get out with the paper ballot. Yeah. Right, and that's. And that's one of the considerations too. When these other jurisdictions are looking at doing primarily ballot marking devices, they have to buy way more equipment because you have to have so many at each polling location to offset not having the ability to have 25 voters voting at the same time. Yes. I went to a general election in Brazil about 10 years ago and they used only I machines. And when you put your voter registration card in, your picture popped up on the screen. Oh, and wow. when you voted for people, their picture popped up on the screen. So people who couldn't read could vote by the picture of the person that they wanted to vote for. Wow. And that was at least 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't Well, I think they went down Maybe they didn't I also want to know, can you lobby for different elections, like Sunday elections, or do 
doing things like that, are you allowed to do that in your office to lobby? If you think there are ways to get more voters to the polls by having different <coughs> times or days of elections? Um, so the county clerks have an association and they do have a lobbyist, but the association itself has kind of a platform, I guess, of things. And so things that have been unanimously or at least passed to be lobbied for are things like no excuse absentee voting. Yeah. Um, all of the clerks in the state are in favor of no excuse absentee voting. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I've gone to testify on that. Uh, since there are bills that are introduced about that, I don't know that it's going to go anywhere. Um, the Secretary of State's office is not for no excuse absentee. Uh, so there is that. Um, primarily, at least I'll tell you right now because I'm only three months into the job, but what I can do is go testify on legislation that's already been proposed, and so I have done that. There's another one that I did want to bring up to people because it's important um, both for election equipment but also for <coughs> elections. There is a closed primary bill that has been making its way. It's already gotten its way through both of the House committees it needs to and will be hitting the floor for debate probably next week. And that would require us to no longer have open primaries. You would have to register to vote with a political party. Um, uh, it's a combined bill, so it's House Bill 26 and 922. And then the companion bill in the Senate is Senate Bill 109. Yeah. That's, uh, that's something that has been problematic. Um, it's going to be problematic in this state because people aren't used to right now declaring themselves Republican, Democrat. Um, right. Yeah independent, this party, that party, the other party. Um, it's going to make it a heck of a lot easier for candidates and for the parties to identify who the heck is a Democrat, who the heck is a Republican, or for a, you know, with the Green Party, or whatever. Because then they'll be able to pull those people and be able to uh, get their names and addresses, it'll help with calling, it'll drive everyone crazy. Just idea. To let you know, that's, like, that's that, the whole idea that's behind a it. Huge, huge difference. Well, and so and so, you know, the way that the current bill is drafted, you would have to declare your affiliation 23 weeks before the August primary. So you have to declare your affiliation before candidate filing starts, and you're locked into that from that period oh, until the uh, until the next election. Is it a general wow. election? From one general election to, to the next? Um, the no, it's just that 23 week deadline. It's a very arbitrary deadline. No one's quite figured out why it's 23 weeks. Um, but, but the implementation of it the way that it is now, uh, if it does pass, and I don't know if it's gonna pass, but it does seem to be fairly popular um, in the legislature, is that we as clerks would have to start collecting information when voters came for the March presidential preference primary and whatever ballot you chose when you came to check in for that. So if you wanna go vote in the Republican presidential preference primary, we would keep track that you chose a Republican ballot and that would be your default affiliation in the voter registration system. And you'd be locked into that until you changed it. And you know that almost half the voters in the United States are independent. Yeah. You know that's actually the biggest voting bloc. So that's a problem. Well, that's, that's a problem. That's yeah. pretty. Uh, your legislator, so, huh? Well, Contact your legislator. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's very. Uh, it's it, <laughs> that's very unfortunate. That's going to really discourage a lot of people oh, yeah. that are already yeah. discouraged. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a list back there of pamphlets. But those are the kind of changes to election law that, that we need to be agile enough with our voting equipment to be able to take into account because um, it, it will change the way that we run elections a little bit, so we have to make sure our equipment can handle it. Or if, if ranked choice voting or, or runoff voting or something like that takes off, um, St. Louis County, for example, is right now running a um, cumulative voting election. It's the first 
ever in the state of Missouri because a judge decided that the way that they run school board elections in Ferguson was not fair, and so they instituted cumulative voting, and so they had to make sure their equipment could handle cumulative voting, which no one knows how to do. So they're going through a lot of education and things like that and working with their voting equipment to make that happen. Grant, would you explain cumulative voting? I'm not familiar with the process. So for, yes. So for school board elections, you know how you can vote for two when there's three candidates. And so you, you choose one, um, one candidate and then a second candidate. If you look at a cumulative voting ballot for that same election and you can choose two school board candidates, it shows the candidates' names twice. So you can make two oh. selections for the same person if you want. And then that's why it's cumulative. Oh. Mm. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. On our current ballot, there are four people listed for school board, and one has withdrawn. Yes. So will anything, I mean, the average person may or may not know that. Is there anything, you know, signs up at the polling places saying this person is not on, really on the ballot? I don't know if that's... Hmm. Um, we don't have any signs because legally the person has to continue to be on the ballot. So I couldn't take them off because the, the deadline for that has moved... Um, with an election law that changed last year. The deadline was used to be six weeks before the election, nothing on the ballot could change. Now it's eight weeks before the election. And Brian withdrew two days after the eight week deadline. So his name has to appear on the ballot under the law because I legally can't take it off. Um, but yes, he's not officially a candidate. What's the deadline for writing candidates enough? Are there any write-in candidates certified for the upcoming uh, local election? There are no write-in candidates certified right now, but they have until the Friday before the election. So there's still some time. But uh, currently there are not. Yes? I missed it if you said that the equipment we are getting will permit us to do uh, uh, voting for multiple That's, yeah, that's a question that will come up when the vendors submit their bids so that we can ask them to make sure that, that they can account for if those changes become law and we do have to do ranked choice voting, they have to assure us that the equipment can handle that. So, yes. Another question, side question, like follow up with that one. If, for instance, in this upcoming election, if Brian Jones gets elected, what's the process to happen then? I, since he's out of state or may already be. Three, two people. It would, it would fall to the school board. Um, so we would, the office would certify the election and then the school board would uh, essentially determine whether they have a vacancy and then how to fill it under their procedures. So it wouldn't be the next two people no. Oh. Well, it could be if that's what the school yeah. board. Decides. That's yeah, it could be. It'd be up to the school board, but not automatically. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, you've got a lot of experienced and knowledgeable people in this room. Well, they only have an opportunity to hear questions posed to the vendors. Uh, when they go there to the one day on-site demonstration or will there be another opportunity like when some of your staff is querying some of the vendors um there will be an opportunity uh during the on-site but then also um feel free to contact the office to ask these questions as well and um and when the staff are asking questions as well uh the a lot of it will, will depend on when the vendors get back to us, uh, when they can be here. I mean, that's really what it turned out. Yeah, I, I just remember out. when they were all here before that the audience could, they could pose questions to the vendors. And that was after they'd already had a demonstration. Yes. So, okay, so that was very helpful. Yeah. But you're saying we have to send our questions to the, your staff? And then they would no, I'm just saying if they come up along the way that you can do that. And then also during the demonstration, it's 
Uh, it'll be the same thing. But you guys might ask better questions. <laughs> <laughs> we will also be at the demonstrations um, as well. Do you have a question? No. But I thought if I think we have a lot of questions. <laughs> I, just, um, I know she's been very informative for us, and hopefully we've given some good questions and feedback to her too. Yes, and if anyone belongs to an organization that you think um, should hear this and would have feedback for, let me know because I'm happy to to send this out to people to go and talk to people. Um, I want as much feedback as possible.